was that she was relegated to the trash bin of society. She was an Egyptian slave. She was a concubine. She was a body for rent, actually. She was used and abused, and we would prefer not to talk about her. We would prefer not to remember that we share in that same reality in our context. We would prefer not to talk about Hagar at all. But the truth remains that, that, that Hagar has become a, a pivotal point of our history of walking with God simply because Hagar was a woman, Hagar was a mother, and Hagar was used by God as well to shape and form society. If we go back to Genesis chapter 16, we would see the first time when Hagar finds herself in the desert. She comes to Abram's house as a slave, as nobody of noble birth. As a matter of fact, she was just considered a nobody, period. She comes to Abram's house. And Sarah, with Sarah, because she became impatient with the promise that God made to her, she decided that she was going to rent out Hagar to her husband. Now that might sound so disgusting to us, but the truth is it was commonplace in that season. It was usual, and, and we'll see that happening with Rachel and Leah, as they used their slaves to compete with one another to see who could give the husband the most babies. These days, we are trying just not to have any more than the one. <laughs> So Sarah sent in Hagar because she just couldn't wait on her. And Hagar apparently was one of those women who as soon as she thought about it, it happened. Because in less than no time, the scripture tells us that she became pregnant and that is when trouble just started for her. She became pregnant and, and she realized that this woman who is my boss, this woman who is my overseer, my mistress, is a barren. Her womb is no good. And, and, and in those days, it was a disgrace for your womb to be seen as no good. And that is why Sarah tried to hustle up the process by sending in Abraham. Abraham, I'm sure, could have said no. But that's another sermon. <laughs> and so she became pregnant and she, she began to get funny. She began to misbehave, so to speak, to Sarah. She began to taunt her. But as the belly grew, she, she, she made sure that, 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 that Sarah saw her pushing down town. She made sure that, that Sarah understood what was going on. I am bringing forth fruit, and you are not. And Sarah, the Bible tells us that, man. And so she retaliated, and she began to mistreat the slave girl. As a matter of fact, she, she began to mistreat her so much that the slave ran away. Where would she run to? She couldn't go back to where she had come from. She had no way of surviving in the desert. And it was in that mix. It is against that backdrop of despair that she gets a divine visitation from God. That the Bible tells us that she is the first woman to receive a divine visitation from God. Did I mention that she was a slave? Did I say that she was a nobody? That she had no status? That nobody really cared about what happened to her? But she was the first woman to get a divine visitation from the Lord. And while she is there thinking that I am going to throw in my towel, while she is there thinking that I would rather die in this desert and let the God just come and pick my bones clean than to go back and deal with that wicked boss. While she is there thinking about the despair that is harboring in her womb along with the child, the Lord comes along and asks the woman, What's going on? She said, You know, I can't deal with this anymore. I can't deal with this. I prefer to die. And then when the Lord speaks to her, strange enough, God does not fix her situation immediately. He, he didn't do what he could have, and he didn't do what we probably think he should have. He didn't fix it. He said to her, go back. Go back to Sarah's house and behave yourself. 
Thank God. Sometimes I think that God sends us as mothers back to the places in our hearts where, where we have tried to run away from, to face what we need to face. Sometimes God says to us mothers, it is you who need to behave yourself. It is you who need to change your attitude because the truth remains that our situations may never change until we do. Sometimes change will only come about when we decide to give ourselves to the change that God is calling us to. Go back. Go back to where we're. Don't stay here in this desert weeping and wailing. Don't do that to yourself. Give your unborn child an opportunity to prosper. Go back. Because in Abraham's tent, at least, you will have bread. And so she goes back. But it's not much longer that we, we find Hagar in the desert again. This time, she has not run away, but she has been sent away. The child that Hagar born, the child that Hagar gave birth to, by law then, should have been Sarah's child. And Sarah now begins to call the woman, not by her given name, but by her trade, but by her status. You know how sometimes we label each other. And this is what we had going on here. Take this bond woman and send her away. She no longer has an identity. She is now known by what she is. Isn't that something? Isn't it something? Isn't it funny, really, that a woman would do this to another woman? A mother of a child would do this to another child. But this is also our reality. We get that mess every day. And so the, the, the bond woman, Again, finds herself in the desert. And, and I want to quote Abraham, whose, whose name by now has been changed from Abraham to Abraham because God did give them the child that he promised them. Says, okay, see. Yes, dear. Happy wife, happy life. Send the dead woman away. And he sends her out in the desert with his child. With one loaf of bread and one bottle of water. Anybody can relate? Anybody in here can relate to me? Sent out in the desert with your children, with his children, with one loaf of bread and one bottle of water to survive. And God comes back to this bond woman. Did, did I tell you that she was an Egyptian slave? Yes. This bond woman, this Egyptian slave, this, this nobody. God comes back and says, Woman, no I made you a promise. I made you a promise. And this promise is not just to you, but to every woman, to all who will give birth, to all who will find themselves crying over their children, to all who will find themselves crying for their own mothers, to all who will find themselves weeping for one reason or the other. God will come to you in the desert places of your life and will remind you, I have made a promise to you. I will fulfill my promise to you. Woman,
family life and pregnancy and childbirth and all of that. But perhaps this day, perhaps God is calling us to rethink pregnancy. Perhaps God is showing us that it is not only about the physical birthing of another human being, but about giving birth to a new life of ministry. Perhaps God is, is calling other women, those who are, are, are weeping and, and are wailing about a child that is yet unborn, the one that is even unformed, the one that they're hoping for. Perhaps God is saying, there's another child that I want you to mother. And its name is ministry. Perhaps God is, is calling us to, to say, just, just set up yourself. So that I, by my Holy Spirit, can impregnate you with something great and marvelous. So that, yes, when you give birth to that, it will become a great nation. Make no mistake here today that what we think is what we give birth to. So when we begin to think that God can, we will give birth to God's possibilities. When we begin to think that God is able, we will give birth to that reality. As we allow God to shape us, as we allow God to, to, to form us and to fill our wombs with the beauty of creation, to fill our wombs with vision, to fill our wombs with new life, God is calling us out of that desert place where we sit beside our one loaf of bread and our one bottle of water. Provisions not enough to support life. The one life, two lives. Hagar stood there. She bawled out to God. She said, I don't want to see the death of my child. For her, it was done. It was over. There was no hope. No life could be left in her child. She, she, she actually saw his life ebbing away on the ground. The ground was soaked with his life. And as a mother, you can only imagine the pain that she felt because she couldn't do anything. The bread was gone. The water was gone. And there was not a spring inside. And what does she do? She raises her heart to God. And God responds. Let me tell you something. That there is something about the ears of God that just cannot hear a cry of distress and not respond. There is something about the ears of God that when a person, a Christian, a child of God, a human being, a slave even, cries out to God. When we fall God's name and God can hear the trumpet in that cry, there is something about the ears of God that will move his heart and he will move with compassion. He will come to our rescue. He will support us. He will lift us up. He will carry us to the waters. He will put our hands on us. We can feel the fullness on him over. He will massage. He will anoint. He will fill us with good things. The word of God tells us that he will fill the poor, those who are marginalized, those who nobody cares about. He will fill them with good things. And the haughty, the proud, the egotist, he will send away empty. This is God's promise, you know. Don't forget what God has promised. The truth about God's heart is that his value, his idea of worth for us is not dependent on our status. It doesn't matter what your birth history is. It does not matter where you are now in society. What matters is the position of your womb, your spiritual womb. What matters is, is, is your desire to allow God to fill you up, to swell you with good stuff so that you can give birth. What matters is your willingness to allow God to use you to transform a world, to create a, a great nation, a mighty people. That's who we are called to be as Christians. Come on with me.
desert. Mothers, come out the desert. Mothers, lift up your hearts to the God who will more than hear. The God who will listen even to the groaning of your child. As you have laid here the by the bush. For a little shade, God will hear the child's groaning even and will move so powerfully on your behalf. You are people of God. It doesn't matter what you have given birth to or not. You are people of God. Understand and be comforted and be satisfied that if you never give birth to a child, that even in the stage of your life when you find yourself, God can allow you to give birth to something wonderful, to something great, a spiritual movement that will shake up the 21st century. God is looking for some women to impregnate, and we don't have to rent ourselves to be, because God will never send us away Neither empty-handed nor with minimal support, God will just never send us out. God values you, and when you avail yourself, when you come and you say to God that yes, Lord, I am available to you, when you sincerely give God who you are, God will raise you up. Give you more than enough provision so that indeed your life will be vibrant, igniting, life giving, life changing, anointing, grace filled, and encouraging. You can be a mighty nation. You can.